Hey guys, this is Josh here with Trillium Wild Edibles, and today I wanted to do something just a little bit different and talk a little bit about some of the different things that can happen whenever you misidentify plants and some of the dangers that that can possibly bring. In this video, we're just going to be talking about some of the different plants that can be easily misidentified with other poisonous plants, and then some of the effects that can happen to you from that misidentification. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Audio or visual hallucination stations are symptoms of poison. Audio or visual hallucination stations are symptoms of poison. Now whenever it comes to the world of foraging and plants in general, there are a lot of plants that can look very similar. And a lot of people might make mistakes as far as identifying certain plants. And they might also misconstrue them or mistake them for plants that are actually poisonous that can cause their bodies a lot of harm. This is possible with not just plants, but mushrooms as well. There are a lot of different plants like for example, poison hemlock that we all know is deadly poisonous. However, it can look somewhat similar to like plants like the Queen Anne's Lace or Yarrow. If you were to make that mistake, there's a very good chance that you're going to die within a couple of hours. Poison hemlock is the plant that Socrates poisoned himself on as he was tried for corruption. Poison hemlock can cause things like violent hallucinations, vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, and even death. Most of the time, whenever people consume hemlock, they usually will start to hallucinate and then vomit and then next thing they know, they're dying. That's a very, very dangerous thing and the fear of misidentification oftentimes keeps people from getting into the subject further and it also keeps them from trying new things. That makes a lot of sense as people don't really want to eat the wrong plant or mushroom and then possibly poison themselves. There are a lot of mushroom species that are very well known for how deadly they can be. Some plants and mushrooms, even a small amount, even a couple grams of them can kill you or put you in a coma. That's very dangerous and very terrifying for a lot of people. There are plants like pokeweed that do not necessarily look like a lot of other plants, except for in the early stages of pokeweed's life. Pokeweed is perfectly edible whenever the shoots are under six inches tall, as long as they're being boiled in a couple of changes of water. However, there are other plants like milkweed that it can look very similar to if you don't do the proper steps of identification. Milkweed itself can look like dogbane, which is also very toxic and poisonous. There are plants like boneset that can look like white snake root, which I've covered in a couple of videos, and white snake root is known for causing milk sickness within cattles that will spread to human beings. Some of the effects of eating these poisonous plants will be vomiting, excessive vomiting, or excessive diarrhea. Mild poisoning can mean you might have dilated pupils, you might have fluctuating heartbeat, you might even have rapid breathing or uncontrollable breathing patterns. You might find yourself wondering what you took or what you ate because you might think you consumed the proper plant when in reality you did not. However, it's also important to note that there are some plants that are taken as a laxative to cause diarrhea, to expel things from your body, and there are also plants that are taken to insinuate nausea or vomiting, to induce vomiting. We're not talking about causing nausea or vomiting for an indicated purpose. We are talking about the unexpected consequence of those things from consuming the wrong plants or mushrooms. There are some mushrooms, like some in the Amanitas family, that are very well known for their hallucinogenic effects, and in some parts of the world, they're very popular for a hallucinogenic mushroom. Some people will take mushrooms or even plants to hallucinate to give themselves a buzz of some kind. However, it's important to note that's usually a sign that you're experiencing some toxins, because the body doesn't naturally hallucinate 
The body isn't naturally tripping, as some would call it. And that can be a very good sign that you've either consumed the wrong plant or you are experiencing symptoms of poisoning. So let's talk for a minute about vomiting. There are several stages of vomiting whenever you have been poisoned by a plant. Some of those stages can be mild nausea and gastrointestinal cramps. That can eventually lead to excessive vomiting where you can actually vomit out so much that you can possibly die from too much vomiting. You know, by throwing up all of the liquids and the foods that your body has absorbed and even throwing up stomach bile. And at that point, if you vomit so much that you're losing stomach bile, your stomach doesn't have anything to consume. And without stomach bile, our stomach cannot digest the food that we do ingest. So without proper digestive juices or bile, you run the risk of doing a lot of harm or potentially dying. These situations are extremified whenever you're in a survival situation or whenever you're lost. A lot of people are aware of Christopher McCandless, who actually died from consuming some of the wrong plants and because of lack of food with excessive diarrhea and excessive vomiting. There's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of debate as to whether he ate the right or the wrong plant or whether he misidentified it. I'm not talking about whether he consumed the right or wrong plant because I was not there. I will say that his story is very indicative of consuming the wrong plant, especially in too high of an amount. There are some plants that you can eat small amounts of and not have any danger come to you. However, if you pick up the dosage, you run a very high risk of poisoning. There's a saying that I like to have. The difference between food and medicine is dosage, and the difference between medicine and poison is dosage. So it's all about the amount you're consuming and what plant you're also consuming. Because like pokeweed is a really good example, pokeweed has phytolacotoxin within all of its parts. The reason that you boil pokeweed shoots in two changes of water is to expel those toxins so that way your body can consume it safely. The root of pokeweed has the highest amount of phytolacotoxin within it, and there are minimal amounts within the leaves and the stems and even the berries. However, too much of any part of the plant can certainly cause you a lot of harm and possibly kill you. Mayapple is another really good example of this. The fully ripened fruits of mayapple are perfectly edible. However, you have to be careful to separate the pulp of the fruit from the seeds, as the seeds can cause you a lot of harm. The root of the mayapple has the strongest amount of the toxin that's within it. If you consume the root for food by mistaking it for another plant, you run the risk of poisoning. That is not something that I want people to do, and I'm sure most of you do not want to have that happen to you either. And that's why it's extremely important to have the proper steps for identification and to follow through those steps in the proper order so that way you have correctly identified whatever plant you plan on consuming, whether it be for food or for medicine. Some of the more mild things that can happen would be, like I said before, dilation of the pupils, where the pupils start to get very dilated, or you could have mild rapid breathing, or it could be severe rapid breathing. You might have intestinal cramps, you might have muscular cramps or muscular spasms. If worse comes to worst, you're possibly going to die. However, in some of the best cases in some of the best case scenarios of accidental poisoning through misidentification, the best thing that's going to happen is you're going to spit the plant out because it tastes bitter and nasty. Most poisonous plants have this defense mechanism that I believe nature provided them with to protect us from these poisonings, and that is a nasty taste. However, it's also important to note that some plants that are poisonous will taste very good, so that can be rather confusing. That's why it's very wise to never put anything in your mouth if you're not sure 100% on what it actually is. There are a lot of people who like to say that Latin names or the scientific name of a plant is a surefire way to know which plant you're looking up. 
And while that may be somewhat true, the scientific name of the plant is not near as important as understanding the botanical features of any plant that you plan on consuming. Whenever you're out foraging as a beginner and you're trying to identify plants, it's a really good idea to have latex or nitrile gloves at your disposal in your bag, as well as separate Ziploc bags to keep any unknown plants separate, so that way you don't have any contamination. There are some plants that, for example, can cause skin rashes or skin infections, poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, silverweed, even dandelion has caused allergies, allergic reactions to people's skin. St. John's wort is a plant that is actually generally very safe. However, it can cause photodermatitis, but that doesn't necessarily mean the plant is toxic. So as a forager, it's up to you to do your part and to have due diligence in identification processes and understanding botanical terms and how they correlate with what it is you're seeing. A lot of people will misidentify plants for various reasons. So let's talk about some of the reasons or ways that you might make that misidentification. One of the main ways that I have seen that people will misidentify a plant is because they want to find a plant so bad that they will misconstrue botanical terms with what they're seeing, i.e. their body, their mind will make them believe they're seeing a plant that they're not actually seeing or that they're seeing features that aren't actually on that plant. I see this a lot whenever I talk to people and they're asking me, hey, is this plant this or is that plant this? And I say, no, it's not that. It can very, it can very easily look similar, but this is this plant. This is not this plant. Whenever your mind wants to find something, oftentimes we make ourselves believe we have found something that we haven't actually found. This leads to misidentification because people get ahead of themselves and don't want to spend the time to make the proper efforts for identification. They're so excited to get a plant and to consume it that they don't spend the necessary time or follow the requirements for proper identification. That's a really good way to poison yourself or your family. Another really common way that people will misidentify a plant is by finding the incorrect information on the internet. I have seen a lot of videos on YouTube where people are talking about plant A, but in reality they're talking about a whole nother plant and they are misidentifying it. I'm not going to name any videos or names of those channels, but I have also found this to be common online when it comes to wild edible blogs as well. And that's rather unfortunate. The majority of YouTube videos that I have seen on the subject are filmed by people who are reading from a book. They do not know the subject well enough to say it off the top of their head. That can be very dangerous, and while some of them might be correct about the plant in the video, they oftentimes are wrong about some of the features of that plant, and then in other videos, they're wrong about the plant they're talking about entirely. This has a very negative effect on the subject and those who wish to participate in foraging. There are some people who think that it's impossible to tell a poisonous plant from a safe plant. That could not be farther from the truth. If you spend enough time learning about each plant, you'll realize how different all plants actually look. There are a few exceptions to that, mainly plants that easily hybridize with each other. And as these plants hybridize, different features will be evident on the plant. Echinaceas, echinacea species are a very common species that a lot of people will confuse because those plants hybridize with each other. They can also hybridize with Rutabecchia species. These two species, Echinaceas and all their varieties, and all the varieties of Rutabecchia species, are different and generally very safe. And if you make a misidentification, it's probably not going to cause you much harm. There are also some plants like the wood sorrel, which looks very much like clover, and a lot of people think it is a species of clover. However, it's not. It's not a trifolium species, it's an oxalis species. But that is a misidentification that will lead to enjoyment 
of the plant because you're going to eat the wood sorrel thinking it's clover and go, wow, this tastes really good. And then you're going to eat a clover and be disappointed because it t doesn't taste lemony. Clovers are generally very bitter and they're also hard to digest raw. That's not because they have toxins within them. It's just because of the plant's natural chemicals that provide some of its nutrients and antioxidant benefits. Wood sorrel is a really good example as well because while it is safe to consume, it does have toxins within it. Those toxins are oxalic acids, which is where wood sorrel gets the first part of its Latin name. Oxalic acids are existent within spinach, rhubarb, kale, broccoli, and so many other vegetables that we consume in our domestic day-to-day -day diet. And too much oxalic acid will actually bind to calcium within the digestive tract and to leach away calcium from the body. This can be very dangerous in high amounts, especially for those who have a diet that is lacking in calcium. However, for most people, that's not of an issue. It could be a major problem if you are in a long-term survival situation and you're not consuming very much food. You really want to avoid things like wood sorrel if you're not getting a lot of calcium. But the odds of being in a survival situation for more than a few weeks is generally very rare. Also, in those kinds of survival situations, you want to really make sure you know the plants because the last thing you want is to vomit or to be hallucinating, whether it be audio or visual hallucinations. You also don't want to have diarrhea in those situations because everything you consume is so important. So let's talk a little bit about some of the poisonings that can happen that cause hallucinations. Pokeweed or Datura jimson weed, as some people might know of it, is very commonly taken in other parts overseas in India for hallucinations and for other medicinal purposes. However, it's very important to keep in mind that you don't consume those plants just for those purposes. And if you do start to hallucinate, there's a really good chance you're already experiencing symptoms of poisoning. Some other plants that can cause hallucinations would be some plants in the nightshade family. Now, there are a lot of plants in the nightshade family and a lot of our domestic produce like potatoes, peppers, tomatoes, are all in the nightshade family. But they have been bred over thousands of years to have those toxins removed through breeding purposes and through domestic agriculture. However, if you find some plants, let's say the morning glory, which is in the nightshade family, as some people consider it, others will consider it in the morning glory family. And botanists sometimes debate these things back and forth, which is why I feel that scientific and Latin names are not the sole purpose of proper identification because sometimes the Latin names are changing constantly and sometimes they're up for debate. A good example of this is toothwort, a completely safe and edible plant that's in the parsley family. However, there are two different scientific names for toothwort, Dentaria lacinata and Cardamine concatenata. Those two names are still being vastly debated to this day. Some plants like bone set have been changed from different family to different family over the years. Lamb's quarters as well has just been recently moved up into the amaranth family from the goosefoot family that goosefoot is one of its common names. However, just because a plant is called goosefoot and you in your area might know of another plant as goosefoot or pigweed doesn't necessarily mean you have the correct plant. That's why it's important to follow through with proper identification procedures. Over the few years that I have done this subject and talked to a lot of people and taught people this subject, I have noticed most people have a very big fear of misidentification and it leads some people to be exceptionally cautious and there's nothing wrong with that. However, it's also important that all of you guys are aware that you can't let a fear of misidentification keep you from learning because the more you learn, the more you earn, I guess. And in the subject of foraging, you're going to earn more plants to add to your life for food and medicine. 
I've noticed more people have a fear of mushrooms for fear of gathering the wrong one. There are a lot of common mushrooms that are extremely delicious and do not have hardly any toxic lookalikes. They're very hard to differentiate from other mushrooms in some people's minds when that is not the case. That is not true. Chicken of the Woods, for example, makes people afraid of it just simply because of its color. They think this bright orange mushroom is possibly dangerous. That's not true. It does have a toxic look-alike, but most of its features are not anywhere near the same. Chicken of the Woods has pores, and the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, its toxic look-alike, has gills and not pores. So all you would have to do is look at the underside of the mushroom and understand the difference between a gilled mushroom and a polypore mushroom. When it comes to bone set and snake root, bone set has very long elongated lanceolate shaped leaves, whereas snake root has oval or ovate shaped leaves. Bone set's leaves are perfoliate, meaning the stem goes through the leaves, whereas snake root does not have that feature. Bone set is also a very hairy plant, whereas snake root is not a hairy plant. Whenever you're thinking of pokeweed shoots in the early spring, when they're very small, they can look a lot like milkweed or even dogbane. All of these plants can be very dangerous if you make the mistake of misidentification. However, milkweed shoots are extremely popular and they're also very delicious and very healthy. However, you still have to boil them to expel some of the toxic properties that can happen. Not to say that milkweed is deadly poisonous because it generally is not. Dogbane, on the other hand, is. Pokeweed, if consumed raw, can be very deadly poisonous. And that's part of the reason that I focus so much on identification in my videos is because I want people to understand how easy it can actually be to tell poisonous plants from toxic plants. Some other really good examples of poisonous plants would be Canadian moonseed and wild grapes. The fruit clusters don't really look anything alike, but to a lot of people, they can misconstrue or mistake Canadian moonseed for wild grapes. The, the wild grape leaves look nothing like the leaves of Canadian moonseed. The fruits taste nothing the same. The, there are tendrils on one and not tendrils on the other. So it's very important that you pay attention and keep in mind all of the specific features of any plant that you plan on using or adding to your diet or medicine cabinet. The last thing I want anyone to do, and I'm sure the last thing any of you guys want to do, is to make the mistake of consuming the wrong plant. So it's important to focus on proper identification features so that way you don't make the mistake and poison yourself or your family because you may not live to tell about it. The best thing that can happen if you make that mistake is you spit the plant out and go, ew, that tastes bitter. However, there are some plants that are perfectly safe and are very bitter. Most of your medicinal plants like bone set or yarrow are, in my opinion, extremely bitter, but that doesn't make them toxic or poisonous. Even though too much bone set, especially fresh, can be extremely dangerous and so can too much yarrow. There are also a lot of misconceptions when it comes to the toxicity of several plants. Sassafras is a really good example. The chemical saffrol is existent within sassafras and is still banned by the FDA for some odd reason. Ironically enough, saffrol has only been found to be about 1 12th as carcinogenic as the ethanol in a can of beer. And you guys, I'm sure some of you know how many cans of beer it takes to actually get alcohol poisoning. So you'd have to drink 12 times more sassafras tea to get saffron poisoning. The odds of that happening before you start vomiting from drinking too much liquid, that you're probably gonna vomit from drinking too much liquid before you're going to get saffron poisoning. However, how would somebody want to drink five gallons of sassafras tea? They wouldn't. Nobody would want to consume that much liquid. It's impossible for your body to absorb and do anything with that much liquid 
in any given time frame of like a day or so. It just doesn't work. So just because there are misconceptions, like with Christopher McCandless or Sassafras and Saffrol, doesn't necessarily mean that a plant is poisonous or going to be dangerous, but it also doesn't mean that the plant is dangerous and you should avoid the subject altogether. The last thing that I want is for people to be afraid of this subject because the world of plants is very diverse, just like all of us, just like you and me. We all have our unique differences and so does every plant. That's why poisonous plants do not look exactly like toxic or safe plants. Example of plants that can look alike, yarrow and hemlock. I mentioned that before earlier in the video. Poison hemlock in reality in my opinion, doesn't look anything like yarrow. There are way too many differences. However, in the young stages, it is possible, if you don't do your part as a forager, it is possible to make that mistake. So I hope this discussion has been helpful to some of you guys, and I hope it's helped some of you see that the subject of foraging is not at all as dangerous as some people would like to believe, and if you don't do your part, it can be very dangerous. That's why it's important to focus on proper identification. Do not make the mistake of assuming you know what a plant is before you have a full knowledge of it. I'm sure most of you can identify a dandelion. If somebody were to tell you a dandelion is stinging nettle, you would know they are incorrect. That's because you have an image in your head you know what a dandelion looks like. The more that you practice this subject, the better off you will become at having an image in your head of what each plant looks like and should look like. This will keep you from making the mistake of misidentification. So I hope this video has been helpful. I thank all of you guys for watching and I will see all of you guys in the next video. If you wanna learn more about wild edibles or medicinal plants, please make sure to subscribe.